Welcome to the wicket. Hello and welcome again to The Wicket, a podcast from Arab News looking at the world of cricket locally in the Gulf, regionally across Asia and worldwide. I'm Brian Murgatroyd and with me to discuss and analyse events across the globe are Arab News columnist John Pike and Arab News cricket reporter Sebash Hamagain. Hello, gentlemen. Good day, Brian. Hello, Brian. Hi, John. And in this episode, we'll be talking about Super Sunday a day when two fantastic tests reached their conclusion as the West Indies sprung a real surprise by beating Australia in Brisbane, while England sprung almost as big a surprise, defeating India in Hyderabad. And on the same day, South Africa's women beat Australia for the first time ever in a 2020 international. We also reflect on the island women's dominance of Zimbabwe in their T20i series in Harare, We discuss the Asian Cricket Council's Men's Challenger Cup in Bangkok with 10 teams, including Saudi Arabia, trying to secure a spot on the road to the 2025 Men's T20 Asia Cup. We analyse the region's major T20 franchise competition, the DP World ILT20, which is continuing in the UAE. We wrap up the Men's Big Bash League season in Australia. We pour over the latest happenings in the ongoing ICC Under-19 Cricket World Cup in South Africa. We review the ICC awards for the past year, the winners of which have been announced since our previous podcast. We reflect on the ICC's decision to end Sri Lanka's suspension. And we ask John and Sebash for their highlights of the past week in cricket. So as ever, lots to cover. So let's get started. It was tough to know where to start this week's episode, given so much has happened since the last one. But we'll begin in Brisbane, where the West Indies produced a stunning performance to end Australia's hopes of a 100% home test summer, winning by eight runs in the day-night test. It was a match that swung one way and then the other. The West Indies were 64 for five before recovering to 311. Then Australia were 24 for four before themselves recovering to 289 for nine declared. Australia then bowled out the West Indies for 193, leaving a victory target of 216. And although Steve Smith, in his new role as opener, carried his bat for an unbeaten 91, it was Shamar Joseph who took the honours with an incredible spell of 7 for 68. What made it incredible in a whole variety of senses was that it was only his second test and his seventh first-class match. Also, he wasn't expected to bowl as the previous evening he'd limped off the field, retired hurt after being struck on the toe by a Mitchell Stark Yorker. But Shamar produced an incredible, fiery and sustained display of pace bowling and it led to the West Indies' first win in Australia since 1997 and ruined the host's hopes of going through the whole summer with victory after victory. John, let's start with Shamar Joseph. Where else? We were full of superlatives for him after his debut test when he took five wickets. But this was another level entirely, wasn't it? Yes, uh, the power of painkillers propelled him to incredible heights. Uh, I think very few people would have expected him to to bowl the following morning after he was totally broken by Mitchell Stark. But he bowled and changed for almost 12 overs, finishing with seven for 68. The downside is he'll miss the ILT 20 because he needs treatment. Um, but he is scheduled to join the, the PSL. So he's a man in demand. He also seems quite a character um, sent to his captain um, on the day that I'm not putting down this ball until the last wicket falls. He also added, I think, in press conferences that I'll always be here to play cricket, test cricket for the West Indies, no matter how much money comes towards me. And I think um, we would all wish that he can hold to that and wish that a few more would do the same. Yes, an astonishing performance on and off the pitch by Shamar Joseph. Sebash Craig Brathwaite's post-match comments indicated his side were fired up by former Australia fast bowler Rodney Hogg's pre-match remarks in the media that the touring side were, in his words, pathetic and hopeless. They certainly showed they weren't that, didn't they? I think that fired them up. Uh, Craig even mentioning that in the post match means they took it up the chin and came back exceptionally well. Uh, I think Australia uh, declaring the innings even when they were in deficit was a call 
that added to the cause. I think they took it uh, very seriously. And as Jones already spoke about high about Samar, I think uh, he was the key there, uh, despite being injured and not knowing whether he'll take the field or not. Even though he said that uh, he would take the field anyway, I think the determination showed by the bowler was great. And the way the captain and team backed him, I think uh, West Indies won the match there. John, this was a real shock for Australia, though. Let's not get away from that. Does it point to a need to refresh the side as they're definitely ageing? Or is it simply a case that they were outplayed and every side is allowed to lose a match, even if they're the Test World Champions? Uh, for me, it was the latter, Brian. Uh, Pat Cummings was full of admiration for the uh, West Indies performance, particularly Shamar, who he said was right up for it. And unfortunately, on that particular day, we were not good enough. Sort of have shades of Devon Malcolm in 1994, his uh, statement to the South Africans, you know, you guys are history. Australia do have an issue of rebuilding coming up, but I don't doubt they'll get it right um, at the right time. Sebastian, a lot of people were waxing lyrical about a revival of West Indies cricket on the day of this result. But this is the same West Indies, let's not forget, that was written off as a basket case after it failed to qualify for the Cricket World Cup. Is the glass half full or half empty, I wonder? Is it the green shoots of recovery or is it simply a rare positive for a team that still has systemic issues? I think uh, Samar's quote on that post-match conference sums up the situation really well. Uh, he said that he'll be available for test cricket and West Indies for whatever money comes up front. I think he was straight and clear on, about that. And I think this gives a glimmer of hope in West Indies cricket now that uh, they can build a new generation that actually cares about the reasons cricket and not just their pro- personal career. Uh, we've seen Australian and English players pulling out of huge deals to keep fit for the national duties. And if Samar sticks to his words and some others follow suit, I think there's a chance of revival for the West Indies cricket. But uh, all being said, doing and saying are totally different things. Yes, absolutely. Let's not forget, of course, that the money available for West Indies cricketers to play for the region is a lot less than uh, got by uh, Australia and England players for uh, doing the same. And let's also not forget that the West Indies fixture list in terms of Test match cricket is by no means as full as Australia and England either. But uh, let's keep our eye on that. The two are now switches to white ball mode with three one-day internationals followed by three 2020 internationals. And we'll talk about that one-day international series in our next episode. Let's talk now about the start of the India-England Test Series, and it's a case of moving from one incredible test to another. England's win was one for the ages. They trailed by 190 on first innings, and only twice before had they won test matches by coming back from such a deficit. One of those was the famous Ian Botham and Bob Willis test at Headingley in 1981, and the other was in the 19th century. The win was founded on a brilliant 196 from Molly Pope and then seven wickets for debutant spinner Tom Hartley on the last day and it was an incredible turnaround for them both. Pope looked all at sea in a brief first innings and that was after he'd struggled in Indian conditions three years ago and Hartley was hit for six from his first ball in the match and conceded 63 from his first nine overs in the first innings. But he had the last laugh by taking seven for 62 as India were unable to chase down a target of 231 on a wearing pitch, eventually bowled out for 202. John, well, you predicted an England win in this series, but I think even you must have been a little bit shocked at how it came about. Where does this victory stand in the recent history of England's overseas successes? Well, Ben Stokes raised it as his best win. That, um, that tells us something. I mean, it did look all over uh, with a 190 deficit, even for me. As you know, my view would be that they'd be OK once they settle in. And it seems that they settle in um, very quickly. For such a raw side, this has to be it with top overseas performances. Even J.K. Lever may have to give away with his um, uh, match winning 10 wickets um, oh, well over 20 years ago. Yes, that was back in 1976 when he got 10 for yeah. 70 uh, on debut. A remarkable performance by that left arm fast bowler, but uh, move over because Tom Hartley's arrived. John as well talked to us about Ollie Pope's innings. It really was incredible, wasn't it? Yes, it was uh, clearly a game changer. And for Rohit Sharma to say it's the best innings he'd seen from an overseas player in Test in India speaks volumes. In modern parlance, ex- execution is all important. And Pope symbolised that with calculated reverse sweeps and ramps to expose vacant feeling areas. Make one mistake on that and you're gone. Obviously, has superb stamina as well. He looked done in after the innings. And uh, technique... Coupled with a grit not possessed by many, 
Um, he has been criticised in the past for not going on to make big scores. Um, hopefully this is going to change uh, that perspective. Yes, a truly remarkable innings from Ollie Pope. And let's not forget his work around the bat as well, because after that 196, he popped up at Silly Point and short leg to uh, take catches to uh, result in the first two Indian wickets in their run chase as well. Sabash, India, well, they had the chance to nail down England's coffin, but they failed to do so when they batted a first time. And they also dropped Ollie Pope on 110 in that second innings. They just lacked that killer touch, didn't they? I think you never expect a team to uh, lose the test uh, after nearly one 200 run lead in the first innings. Uh, but I think India gave uh, England way into the match. They took things with ease after the impressive first innings batting performance, uh, even though Rohit later said that they were 60 to 70 runs short. And I think Pope took his chances after the drop and England's lower order helped him in the cause. And I think they're still far away from their ideal test batting lineup. Their batters cut starts and failed to convert it into big like Pope did. Three scores of 80s really explains that uh, could have had a big innings to turn the game. Uh, even Ravid agreed that these players are not yet set for the test cricket, but uh, I think they're back from continuous white ball cricket and should be ready for the next four games. Well, we'll see about that. And of course, India have to make do without K.O. Raul. And also Ravindra Jadeja, they're out with the injury from that second test. There's no Virat Kohli as well. Is it crisis time for India, Sabash, or, or do you think they can cope? I think they can cope and they should. Uh, players like uh, Sarfaraz Khan, who has been included in the squad, are waiting for opportunity to sign and really get into the mix of the test squad. He has numbers in domestic cricket for a few years now and is waiting for an opportunity and... If he can make it count, I think there will be changes for the other matches and maybe the whole test scenario. You ought to have test specialist batter and not just depend on the white ball cricketers. Uh, I think KS Bharat uh, should get some runs now to back his selection. Uh, one nil down in the series. Uh, and if things don't go India's way, I think uh, baseball will pass the test uh, of their toughest uh, test. John, let's talk about Tom Hartley. What an incredible show of character from him to produce what he did in the face of India's batting onslaught on him. And he batted very well as well, quite crucially, in fact, in the second innings. Uh, yes, he did. I think he'll be the first to pay tribute to Stokes for keeping him going in the first innings when all around was saying, take him off. Build uh, build his confidence, as you say, not only for bowling, but also for batting. Quite extraordinary, really. What a sweet experience it must be to know that the Indian batters have targeted you and that you get the last laugh. So far, selection is vindicated, tall, Bowling from a height with turn. It's early days, but taking India on in their backyard is pretty audacious. I think there's talk about even playing four spinners for the second test. And maybe, you know, the game plan is to try and force India to prepare some different wickets. Who knows? Yes, as you say, John, it is early days. Let's not forget that when England toured India three years ago, they won the first test there in Chennai and won it well and ended up losing that series, a four-match series, by three matches to one. Sebash, talk to us about the two captains, Ben Stokes, the alchemist, and Rohit Sharma, now a man under pressure. I think uh, baseball has taken a lot of limelight off Stokes. Uh, but if you see his leadership and decisions, he's turned the test side to an absolute winning mentality. Even as a player, he's been performing well. And the fact that he has 14 wins in 20 matches, I think that alone is enough to explain why the wins are no fluke. Uh, Rohit, on the other hand, is under huge pressure. Uh, I think not just a captain, but a batter to South Africa. Pro was a huge disappointment for him and has not converted the starts in the first test as well. I think uh, India should be starting to looking for options uh, leadership-wise. And I think Rohit, uh, after that, uh, Kohli's legacy has not been continued for India in tests, so he's under huge pressure. Well, that pressure will continue in the second test in uh, Vishakapatnam, which gets underway on Friday, February the 2nd. And we'll chat about that in our next episode. The Super Sunday we've already spoken of also extended to the South Africa women's tour of Australia, as on that same day, South Africa's women beat their hosts for the first time in 24 meetings across two formats. That's One Day Internationals and 2020 Internationals. They won by six wickets in the second of three 2020 Internationals after losing the first game the previous day by eight wickets. South Africa captain Laura Volvart was the heroine for her side with 58 from 53 balls at the top of the order in that maiden victory, with her opening partner Tasmin Brits making 41 from 28 balls. Marazan Cap, she weighed in with 20. In the end, it was a comfortable win with an over to spare. 
Normal service, though, was resumed two days later as Australia won the deciding match of the series in Hobart by five wickets with four balls to spare, courtesy of a remarkable innings by Beth Mooney, who's become an absolute run machine. She made 82 from 55 balls as Australia made relatively light work of chasing down an apparently testing target of 163. Sebash, Looking at that South Africa victory in the second match of the series, I'm not sure we saw that coming, did we? Even allowing for the fact that they reached the T20 World Cup final where they lost to Australia last year. With the way Australia was playing, I think South Africa was out of the scene, but uh, they can be proud of the performance they put in, even though they lost the series. All the matches went into the last overs, uh, was competitive, and they even posted their highest total. But I think they were outdone by the brilliant batting from the Aussies. Australia won the series. Excellent Beth Mooney getting runs despite illness in the last match. Uh, and But uh, positive side for South Africa, they were in all the matches. Uh, Cap rescued the innings in third game and showed that uh, they can be competitive with the bat too. Absolutely. But John... Are Australia more fallible than they once were? They lost both the T20I and ODI series to England in England last year. They dropped a test and a T20I to India on their recent uh, tour there. Or, more encouragingly for uh, the women's game as a whole, is it a sign that the overall standard is improving across the board? It looks like the latter to me, Brian. Of course, it may only go on to spur Australia onto greater heights. As you mentioned, response to the defeat was to win the third match narrowly, with four balls to spare. There's Beth Mooney in uh, sick mode leading the way. But I think, as we've already discussed, South Africa ran them closer than we thought before the matches began and I think these are healthy signs. Well next up it's a three match one day international series starting in Adelaide a day night game on Saturday February the 3rd. The Ireland women's team their progress towards the global T20 World Cup qualifier in Dubai later this year has continued nicely with a series win in Zimbabwe, following on from a win in an ODI series between the two teams. Amy Hunter has been the star of the show in the series. She made 101 in match one as Ireland scored 191 for three and won by 57 runs. And then in match two, she scored 77 not out as Ireland again batting first, cruised to a 42-run victory. Hunter really is a prodigy as she scored her maiden one day international 100 also against Zimbabwe on her 16th birthday back in 2021. She's still only 18 now and her 2020 international 100 on this tour makes her the only Ireland woman batter to reach three figures in both ODIs and T20Is. John, are you surprised at the way Ireland dominated the T20I series? Not really. Ireland's been emerging from the shadows of a colonial legacy and a place behind other sports in the country for you know, a good 30 years. And there is a naturalness to uh, to go cricket amongst Irish players, possibly from uh, bringing in the hurling, uh, which is now becoming apparent. Yes, it uh, certainly is great to see them developing in the way they are. Ed Joyce, of course, is coaching the Ireland women's team and he's doing a great job of it too. Sebash, what does this series tell us about the chances for these two teams at the global qualifier? I think it's a good preparation ahead of the qualifiers, but uh, the ride is never going to be easy in the qualifiers. I think Sri Lanka and Thailand are involved there. Uh, both have exceptional squad and... Uh, only two sports are up for grabs. Uh, UAE, Uganda, they seem to be equally competitive as well. Uh, it's good that Ireland and Zimbabwe are keeping the players in the group with this preparatory series, but uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's a next level challenge ahead in the qualifiers. The Asian Cricket Council Men's Challenger Cup is taking place in Bangkok, Thailand, with two teams looking to secure spots in the ACC Premier Cup, which is the qualifying event for the 2025 Asia Cup, where the major teams in the region battle it out for 2020 international supremacy. The Challenger began with a three-team event between China, Cambodia and Myanmar, with Cambodia winning through to play alongside Bhutan, Indonesia and Saudi Arabia in Group A, while Japan, the Maldives, Singapore and Thailand are in Group B. The all-important semi-finals take place on February the 9th, as only two teams can go forward to the next stage, while the final is two days later. Sebash, which teams are favourite to progress here and why? 
Uh, for me, I think uh, Saudi Arabia and Singapore, they're going to go on beaten until the finals. Uh, they are the teams who can compete with the elite associates and they have the players in disposal as well. There are some ex- experienced players as well as some exciting youngsters in both the teams. Uh, Abdul Wahid can be destructive up top for Saudi with uh, youngster Baldar Raf spinning way with his left arm. Uh, also for Singapore, I think they had, had a good preparation going to Sri Lanka, playing some friendly matches. Uh, but uh, if they don't get the services of Zanak Rakas, I think they will need to lean on veterans Surendra and Chandra once again. Well, it's going to be interesting to see how uh, that tournament progresses. And John, it's great to see how some of these countries, not ones normally associated with cricket, are uh, doing. How important are tournaments like this for the visibility of cricket in these countries, do you think? Absolutely vital. Cambodia, for example, coming through the qualifying stage has put their name in lights and surprised many people who probably had no idea that there was any cricket played at all in in the country. We, of course, have uh, an interest in the Saudi Arabian team and we have a man on the ground there, uh, Richard Lockwood, who will be reporting on Saudi Arabia's matches. They done a preview which um, will be available in, in Arab news and and uh, he's point, putting them up as uh, as favourites, having uh, won the equivalent tournament um, last year. So there's even more pressure upon the Saudi Arabian team to uh, emulate what they did, um, did last year. Uh, so we'll be keeping a close eye on that. Yes, we can keep a close eye on that, uh, most definitely. And if you want to do the same, please go to the Arab News website, where you can follow all the action, and particularly the Richard Lockwood's reports on the Saudi Arabia matches. In our next episode, we'll update you too on what's happening in the tournament. In the UAE, the second edition of the DP World ILT20 is now in full swing. And as we record this podcast on Wednesday, the 31st of January, the group stage is about halfway through. There are six teams in the franchise tournament. And so far, the biggest talking point among those teams has been the struggles endured by the Desert Vipers, one of the finalists from season one, but have won only two of their first five matches this time, despite recruiting four high-profile Pakistan players, Shaheen Shah Afridi, Mohamed Amir, Shadab Khan and Azam Khan, to bolster their ranks. They were actually bottom of the table until a last ball win against league leaders MI Emirates on Tuesday, January the 30th, a result that I guess illustrates how close together the sides are this season. John, why do you think it is that the Vipers have so far failed to convert a good-looking team on paper into one that does well on the field? Well, I think you probably have to be on the inside to to know why. Seems they got a get-out-of-jail card against the um, MI Emirates in the 15th match with the last ball victory, having looked dead and buried to revive their hopes of a top four finish. The coach referred to a um, very scrappy performance. A man of the match, uh, Mohamed Amir, admitted that they'd not been playing very good cricket. They haven't scored enough runs uh, when required, although they've sort of battered the average number of uh, runs uh, per innings. It's not come at the right time. Maybe the you know the top order, Colin Munro, Alex Hales, for example, maybe they are entering the late career stages and uh, maybe it's going to be time to um, bolster that top order batting. Yeah, I'm sure it was no coincidence that the Vipers secured that win over MI Emirates by uh, holding their catches. They've been notoriously poor in terms of their uh, out cricket over the uh, last year or so, but all the catches were held and a couple of crackers too. And that certainly went a long way to securing that victory over MI Emirates. Sebash, what have you made of the first half of the group stage? Uh, as John said, I think result-wise, surprised with the way Vipers have struggled, but the win over the table toppers have brought balance into the table now. A run of a couple of games, and anyone can go anywhere. Individual-wise, I think Wasim and Sarafu's batting has been a huge positive for UAE cricket. I think this is what the leagues would be offering. Uh, sadly, we don't seem to find other UAE players in the bowling chart as much, and hopefully, we'll see such names from the UAE cricket in the bowling chart. Yes, Mohamed Wasim picked up. Uh... The uh, the belt for the uh, the top run scorer in the tournament after that game against uh, the Desert Vipers. So he's in very good form indeed. And yes, uh, Ali Shan Sharafu, what a performance from him against the Vipers. He made 82 not out from 47 balls. It really was a fantastic innings in Abu Dhabi. So it's clear to see that UAE players, particularly with the bat, are getting their opportunities and... In many cases, they're taking them. We'll continue to uh, keep an eye on the DP World ILT20 and, of course, update you in our next episode.
The men's BBL was won by Brisbane Heat in Australia, who secured the title, their second and their first since 2013, with a convincing win over the Sydney Sixers at the Sydney Cricket Ground. The BBL featured 44 matches between eight teams. It was a reduced schedule in comparison to the previous four seasons, which had each featured 61 games, and it's fair to say the tournament has revived the BBL as a brand. Sebash, despite gimmicks in T20 tournaments around the world, the truth is that these events still rise and fall on the quality of the cricket on the ground. And it was good this time, wasn't it? They managed to get some of the test squad playing during the tournament in breaks between tests. And that worked too. Well, this is a speciality of PBL. I think there seems to be balance in place between the franchise and the national teams always. We don't see this in any other boards or even other sports. The players are well known to shift in and out of the format and that doesn't really hamper the performance as well. Uh, in a way, I think uh, these national team players leave a space for new talents to get the chance. And this has helped the senior team to get some new backups or new talents or not as well. Absolutely. But John, I guess the major talking point from the tournament was the fact that it suffered an exodus of players ahead of the finals series as players headed away primarily to the ILT20. The BBL, of course, isn't a franchise event but I've spoken to players who say the money on offer now is certainly good enough. The issue seems to be that their draft isn't a guarantee of a place in the tournament, where, of course, other rival events can contract players. And if you're offered a choice between a place in a draft and a, an absolutely certain contract, players will almost always take the latter, won't they? How does the BBL solve that issue? Well, it's not easy to resolve. I mean, the exodus did take the steam out of the BBL, for sure. In an ideal world, the schedule needs looking at, but this is not an ideal situation. I think the onus is really upon the BBL. They talk about, uh, you talked about money. Well, it might have improved for this year, but it still wasn't sufficient to attract some of the players. Um, who could get more money elsewhere for playing uh, fewer games. And I think the BBL has got a bit of uh, uh, searching to do in terms of contractual arrangements, if there's any movement in that, and maybe even to shorten the competition again, um, because there there is quite a bit of spare time within it. In my view, squads are a bit too big in the IOT20. Uh, there's some very good players, Baz Leader, for example, not really getting a look in. I think that's probably a discussion for another time. Let's talk now about the ICC Under-19 Cricket World Cup. And at the time of recording, the Super 6 stage of the tournament in South Africa has started with 12 teams divided into two groups of six ahead of the final stages. Group A in the Super 6 features India, Pakistan, New Zealand, Bangladesh, Nepal and Ireland, while Group B includes Australia, Sri Lanka, West Indies, South Africa, England and Zimbabwe. John, Australia, India and Pakistan are the three sides who've carried maximum points forward into the Super 6 stage. Will the winner come from one of those three sides, do you think, or, or can you see another team emerging? I can't really see much beyond India at this stage, to be honest. I just think they're showing that they have all-round strength, uh, they have some outstanding players, and I think that they, um, they're likely to be too good for the others. I'm not saying they're going to be some close games, but I just think they carry too much weight. Sebash, let's talk to you now about your highlights of the tournament so far, and I'm pretty sure I can guess Nepal's win against Afghanistan that secured them a Super 6 spot must be right up there. Certainly, Brian. Uh, Nepal's journey to top six has been excellent. The team struggled in Asia Cup and they really needed to prove themselves in the world stage. They really competed well in group stage matches ahead. But the Afghanistan win was uh, something that made all of us proud. And at the end, it became more special as we became the only associate and only team to knock out test teams out of the group stage. Well, into the Super 6, but we are out of contention even before we played a match. A bit of bitter experience there as the players will be playing two big matches, but whatever you do there, there's not much, nothing much into the offer. But uh, all being said, uh, even though we are in Super 6, I think uh, ICC needs to look uh, at the journey for the next edition because the Afghanistan's group is, group stage exit has made things tougher. I think there are rumours that Afghanistan should be coming down to play the qualifiers because of their exit. And with UAE already in the mix and only one place in offer, I think it's nothing sort of criminal for Nepal that they're into Super 6. Yes, it's a difficult situation when a side gets into the Super 6 stage and then, of course, 
hasn't carried any points forward. It makes it uh, almost impossible, really, to to progress to the very latter stages of the uh, tournament. But uh, as you say, Sebash, that's for another time and uh, another discussion within ICC Towers to to work out the right format for the next tournament. Well, the final of this tournament is on the 11th of February and we'll update you again in our next episode. Let's talk now about the ICC Awards and the results of the 2023 vote have been announced since our previous podcast. The Men's Cricketer of the Year was announced as Pat Cummins, the Australia captain, while Nat Siver Brunt of England secured the Women's Award. Rather than us just listing every player who won an award or who was named in a team of the year, something that would take us quite a long time, as in addition to the individual winners, there were also teams of the year named across all the formats. What we'll do is pick out our highlights for you. John, what were yours? Aside, of course, from Ratchin Ravindra of New Zealand, winning Men's Emerging Player of the Year, of course. Well, of course. Um, well, he's been... Um... Seems to have been kept at a wraps a bit of late. And as almost obviously Pat Cummins, who's uh, had an incredible 2023, well-deserved. Other for me would be Zimbabwe winning the Spirit of Cricket Award. And they um, knocked out a very disheartened uh, West Indies. And I think um, Natshiva Brunt for back-to-back awards in a very strong field. Yeah, she's been absolutely outstanding. Uh, a really, truly brilliant cricketer uh, across the formats. Sebash. What about your highlights? Uh, Travis said being the only player in both ODI and Test team actually uh, has added his, to his the player of the year accolade. Also, if you look at the team of the year in all three formats, uh, the individuals are different in men's side. Something we never thought about some five years ago. But uh, in no men's side, if you see there are same names in two formats. So I think uh, the one format uh, specialist player, uh, that that's really going to be a thing now. Yes, you're mentioning uh, Travis Head uh, there, Sebastian. What a level of cricket is. Because, of course, he got a king pair in the test match against uh, the West Indies in Brisbane. If you want uh, a full list of the winners, you can find them uh, on the ICC website. That's www.icc-cricket.com. And while we're on the subject of the ICC, one other news line to bring you is that the global governing body has lifted its suspension of Sri Lanka with immediate effect. It means funding of Sri Lanka cricket can now resume and SLC can also attend ICC meetings in full capacity. But of course, it doesn't alter the fact that the country has missed out on staging the ongoing Under-19 Cricket World Cup. Remember, the suspension took place because of what the ICC believed was interference in the governance of the game in that country by the political leaders of Sri Lanka. And finally, gentlemen, we'll continue the trend of recent weeks of picking a highlight or something that caught your attention from the past week of cricket. What's that been, uh, John? Well, for me, it's Ben Stokes' run out of uh, Jadeja. For a man just out of knee surgery, and an inspirational captain, of course, this was quite extraordinary by his standards. In the past, the ball would have been gathered with two hands and thrown in. Here, Stokes grabbed the ball, 10 yards away at a sort of mid-on, one-handed in a near horizontal position and launched the ball at the stumps, also one-handedly, securing a direct hit. Quite outstanding. And it was so clearly out, I don't really think a review was needed. Yes, it was an astonishing piece of fielding. It reminded me a little bit, actually, of Mark War's uh, run-out of, uh, I think it was Alan Donald in the uh, semi-final of the World Cup back in 1999, because it was, uh, once again, a little flick from the back of the hand. Really uh, astonishing uh, expertise from Stokes and uh, a superb run out. So, Bash, what about you? What's been your highlight of the past week? Brad, it has to be the 19 World Cup and Pacer Akasan running through the top order of Afghanistan. Uh, someone who came into support senior team player of Himsarki as an eight bowler, making his way to the World Cup and dominating the Afghani team. I think that's a sweet story. Yes, a remarkable performance and a superb effort from Nepal to get to the Super 6 stage, given, as Sebash mentioned in uh, the podcast a little earlier, how they've struggled in the uh, Asia Cup prior to uh, this uh, tournament. Well, 
That's all for this episode. Thanks so much for joining us at The Wicket. We'll be back soon with more cricket chat from the Gulf region, Asia and worldwide. Please don't forget to like, subscribe and comment on what you've heard wherever you get your podcast. We'd love to hear your feedback and, of course, let us know if there's anything you'd like us to feature in future episodes. For now, though, this is Brian Murgatroyd along with John Pike and Sebastian Hummergain saying thanks so much for listening. And we look forward to your company again next time.